Okay, welcome back quantum friends. Good to see you again. It's good to be seen. I appreciate your loyalty. Amazingly, we have reached chapter 11 of physics, computer science, 219A. The term is just whizzing by. I guess that means we're having fun. So let's, without further uh, shenanigans, get going. Okay, so we began at the end of the last lecture to discuss quantum circuits. We will continue with that today and in fact on into lecture 12 for a while as well. Last time, building on the previous discussion of classical circuits, we talked about randomized and reversible classical circuits, which set us up for introducing the quantum circuit model, which we had just gotten around to formulating at the end of the previous lecture. And today I want to address some basic questions about the quantum circuit model of computation. For one thing, we know quantum gates being unitary transformations live in a continuum. And we'd like to understand if we're experimental physicists or computer engineers, just how accurately the gates in our hardware need to approximate the ideal gates in some quantum circuit of interest in order to give us computationally useful results. Um, we'd like to see how complex, from the perspective of how large a quantum circuit is, required our typical unitary transformations. You remembered we asked a similar question about Boolean functions, uh, the size of the circuits needed to compute typical Boolean functions. There's a quantum version of that question that we'd like to consider. Uh, we'd like to know if there's some bound on the classical resources that are needed to simulate a quantum computer. Can we say it can be done with uh, such and such uh, amount of memory or some specified number of gates? And uh, we'd like to understand more deeply the concept of a universal gate in the quantum circuit model. And we'll uh, be getting to all of those things today. The discussion of universal gates will continue into the next lecture as well. So let's just reorient ourselves. Remember uh, the formulation of the quantum circuit model that we discussed last time. The arena in which the computation takes place is the Hilbert space of n qubits spanned by the two to the n computational basis states of n qubits. It's important for the model that we have not just very large Hilbert space, but also a preferred decomposition into small subsystems. That's what allows us to talk about complexity because in the circuit model, our gates only act on some small specified number of qubits and we uh, are interested in the question, how many gates do we have to put together to solve some computational problem? We assume we can initialize the computer in a product state, like the state in which all the qubits are in the state zero. And we have hardwired into our machine or into our model, some set of quantum gates, some finite set, which are universal. And universal means that by putting circuits together built from those gates, we can get as close as we want to any unitary transformation acting on the n qubits. We're taking it for granted that there's a classical computer behind the scenes controlling the quantum computer. Formally, that comes in because we would like to discuss complexity in the circuit model. And for that purpose, we need to speak of families of circuits that are uniform and that notion of uniformity will be defined by whether the circuits can be constructed by a Turing machine efficiently. A classical Turing machine designs the circuit, which is then executed to perform the quantum computation. And in the end, of course, we need to read out a result, which we do by measuring one or more qubits. In the model, it's enough to consider measuring only one, particularly if our goal is to compute some Boolean function. And of course, that being a quantum measurement, that final result 
is probabilistic, not deterministic, given a quantum circuit, when we read out the answer bit at the end, we won't definitely get a zero or a one, but rather there will be some probability distribution for those outcomes. Now, there isn't anything in this model, which I've now completely specified, that can't be simulated by a classical computer, but as far as we know, that simulation is not possible efficiently. The intuition is that because the Hilbert space is so vast inside, the size, the quantum gates are acting on this two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. And it takes a lot of resources to keep track of how the state is evolving in that vast space. Now we can define a complexity class as the class of problems, decision problems that we can decide efficiently with the quantum circuit model. That class is called BQP, bounded error quantum polynomial time. And we believe, though we can't prove it from first principles, that BQP is a larger class than BPP, that quantum computers can efficiently do things that ordinary classical computers, even randomized ones, cannot do. All right, now let's, let's take up the question of accuracy. I might have some ideal quantum circuit, which if I could execute it, would solve some problem of interest. But in a real device, we're not going to be able to hit those unitary transformations right on the nose. There will always be some error since the unitary transformations live in a continuum and they can't be specified to an infinite number of bits of precision. So when we speak of approximating a ideal circuit with real hardware, the gates which are applied are not exactly the ideal gates. They have some small error. And so if I put together capital T gates and get some final state, which will then be measured to get a final outcome, uh, the actual state is not going to be the same as the ideal state, okay? Now those errors are going to accumulate over the course of the execution of the circuit. And we'd like to understand how bad the news is about that. Now, I'm considering these noisy gates to be unitary transformations. I claim I'm entitled to do that, as we've discussed before, because while they might actually be, say, um, trace preserving completely positive maps, I can always add an environment for each one of the gates and consider a unitary acting on the quantum data in the computer and the environment to describe that operation. So in that case, you should think of this approximate state as not just being a state of the computer itself, but the computer and its environment. In the ideal case, there is, if you like, a state of the environment, but the ideal gates don't act on it at all. So if we have an initial product state of the data in the environment, uh, that never changes. Now, these actual noisy unitary transformations will differ from the ideal one by some small error, some deviation, an operator which I called E sub T for the gate, the teeth gate in the circuit. And I'm going to characterize the size of that or error using the sup norm, the operator norm of that deviation, E sub T. You remember what that means? It's the uh, the largest singular value of the operator E sub t. And let's suppose that we built our hardware well enough that for each one of the gates, that error is bounded by some hopefully small constant, let's call it epsilon. And now we'd like to know when we put together capital T of these gates, if we want to get about the right answer, how small do we need that error to be? And in particular, how is it going to scale with the size of the circuit with the total number of gates? Now, remember in the end, we're going to perform a measurement and it's enough to just measure a single qubit. Uh, but let's suppose just for the sake of argument that we actually measure all the qubits. In fact, I'm gonna imagine measuring all the qubits of the environment as well, the environment that I need to describe the noisy operations. In the end, I might only be interested in the marginal probability distribution when I sum over all uh, the other measured bits except for the answer bit I care about. But that marginal distribution, um, if the, well, I guess, let me put it this way, if the 
complete distribution for all the possible outcomes is close to the ideal one, that will certainly be true for that marginal distribution. So it's enough for me to consider the requirement that the complete distribution, when I measure everything, is close to the ideal one. So what is that? What is the probability distribution I'm talking about? Well, we're measuring in some complete basis the final state after we've done, we finished applying all the gates in the circuit and the probability of getting a particular computational basis state as an outcome is just the inner product squared of that computational basis state uh, with the final state of the computer at the end of uh, the execution of the circuit. That's the ideal probability distribution. That's what we're shooting for. But the actual probability distribution, that shouldn't be an A, that should be an X, sorry, uh, is the uh, inner product of computational basis state X and also including potentially additional uh, bits of the environment uh, with the noisy state. And so I want these to be not too far, far apart from one another. And I think you know from an exercise that uh, the nice way of quantifying how scalar probability distributions are is to use the, uh, the one norm for um, the L1 norm for probability distributions up to a factor of one half, which we include by convention. The uh, norm is just the sum over all the possible outcomes of the difference of the probabilities given by the two distributions absolute value. And I, what you showed in the exercise is that that's less than or equal to the, um, boy, there's a, this should, there's a bar missing on the cut here. Okay, sorry about that. But this is just the difference between two state vectors, the ideal state and the noisy state. So the idea is that we want that to be small. Okay, let's go back. Um, now remember in the, the way we defined BQP is that we wanted to get the correct answer with a probability at least two thirds, but actually getting the correct answer with the probability of uh, success, one half plus some uh, small constant would be good enough because we could amplify it by running the computation some modest number of times. So if the ideal circuit gets the right answer with probability um, two thirds, uh, I would like the um, noisy probability distribution to have an error which is say less than one sixth so that I'll still get uh, the right answer for the answer bit with probability one half plus uh, some positive constant. Uh, so I'd like this to be less than some constant number, uh, you know, let one sixth or something like that. And uh, so how are we going to do that? Well, we have to look at what the error is when we add up together the errors in all of the gates in the circuit. There's kind of a convenient way of organizing that so it's easy to get a bound on it. So what I'm calling U tilde, that's the noisy circuit. It's the product of all the noisy gates. Um, the product of all the uh, U sub T tildes, each one of the U sub T tildes is a U sub T plus an E sub T. So I'm gonna organize that this way. First, I pull out all the terms that don't have any errors at all. That's the ideal circuit. And then I pull out all the terms in which I have the error E1 acting at the uh, first gate in the circuit. And then I include all other uh, configurations for uh, the rest of the circuit. It could be an error, or it could be ideal. So that term is just E1 acting at the first gate and then the noisy U tildes acting on gates two through capital T. And then the next term is one in which um, there's definitely an error in the second gate, but I don't wanna double count. So I don't wanna include the case in which there's also an error in the first place because I already counted that. So I have now the ideal gate uh, in the uh, time window one the error in one, time window two, and then the noisy gate for time step three through capital T. And I go on like that. The next term is the one in which we definitely have an error in um, the third gate to avoid uh, double counting. I'm then going to consider only the ideal unitary in the first time step and the second, but the noisy unitaries from then on.
and so on. So you can see I wind up getting a difference between the ideal unitary, which is this first term, and the noisy unitary, which is the sum of all the terms, which is a sum of t terms. And I'd like to get a bound on the sup norm of that total error, because that's going to tell me how much the final state vector, or give me a bound on how much the final state vector deviates from the ideal state vector. And now let's look at each one of these terms. Well, each one of them is a product of unitaries, because remember, the noisy use and the ideal use are both unitaries, except there's one error inserted in each one of the terms. Everything else is unitary. Now, the sup norm of a unitary transformation is one, right? Because its eigenvalues are all bases with the absolute value one. And when you take the sup norm of a product of operators, we know we can bound that by the product of the sup norms. And so each one of these terms has a sup norm, which is just bounded by the sup norm of the corresponding error the sup norm of E1 or E2 or E3, okay? Um, and they're all together capital T such terms. And I know the sup norm of a sum can be bounded by the sum of the sup norms. So if each one of the terms has a sup norm which is bounded by epsilon, because remember we said that uh, E sub T has a sup norm bounded by epsilon, then the sum of them all has a sup norm bounded by capital T times epsilon. And we want to make sure that that's less than some small constant of order one delta. And for that purpose, we want the error epsilon to be less than delta over capital T. Because when we have T gates, the error is going to get capital T times bigger, as you might have guessed. OK, so we don't have to have incredibly accurate quantum gates to get uh, an answer with an acceptably small deviation from the ideal case. But we do need better and, in general, we're going to need better and better gates if we want to do longer and longer computations. So the news isn't terrible, but it's still not very good. Because if I wanted to solve some problem people might really be interested in, like factoring a really large number or solving some chemistry problem, I might need billions of gates. And so I would like to have an error per gate in order to get an acceptable answer in that case, which is like 10 to the minus 9. That's really, really hard to do with hardware that we have now or that we're likely to have for quite some time. The best error rates for two qubit gates now are at at the under ideal conditions at the 10 to the minus three level. What I just said was a factor of a million better than that to do say, or even, or even worse, if I want to factor a large number or something like that. And, uh, but the, uh, the good news is that the theory of quantum error correction and fault tolerant quantum computation, which we're not going to talk about this term, but which I think you'll hear about next term, uh, that tells us that if we're willing to pay a price in overhead to have the size of the circuit increase by some factor which goes like a power of a logarithm of the size of the ideal circuit, then it turns out to actually be acceptable to have the error per gate less than some sufficiently small constant. And that constant is, well, it's um, probably around 1%, something like that. So if you can get gates to that accuracy, and you can put together lots and lots of qubits and lots and lots of gates, then you should be able to solve hard problems. To, to feel comfortable, I'd like that error rate per gate to be more like 10 to the minus three than 1%. But um, in principle, maybe 1% would be enough, but the overhead cost would be, uh, would be pretty bad in that case. So that's the story of accuracy. Now let's ask the question, since it's interesting uh, to consider how things might be different in the quantum case. We asked the question in the classical case, you know, how big a circuit do we need to compute a typical Boolean function? We were uh, horrified, well, maybe not really, but uh, it was notable that most Boolean functions require really, really large circuits, exponential in the number of bits of uh, the input to the problem. And so in, from that point of view, most problems, 
the computation of most Boolean functions is hard. And in uh, the real world, we're only going to care about the ones that we can solve a lot more efficiently than with a circuit size that's exponential in n. It's a similar story in the quantum case. Hilbert space is really big. And what that means is <clears throat> that the space of unitaries is really big. Um, and if you wanted to be able to come as close as we please, or well, with some reasonably small error, to every possible unitary transformation on acting, acting on n qubits, that's a lot of unitary transformations. We can estimate how many this way. Um, we consider the unitary group acting in a capital N dimensional space. We have in mind little n qubits, so capital N is an exponentially large space, two to the n. And now every point in this uh, gray ball that I've drawn is a unitary transformation. Of course, there are an uncountable number of them, but I'd be satisfied to be able to approximate each one of the unitary transformations with some small error delta in the soup norm. So I'd like to cover the space of unitaries with little balls with have, have a radius, a delta. And if I can cover the whole unitary, then um, for any unitary you're interested in, in UN, um, it'll be inside one of those balls, okay? So it can be approximated um, to within the air delta by some unitary which you can think of as being the, uh, the center of that ball. The question is, how many balls do we need? Well, the balls have some small radius. I'm called it delta. The, um, the whole uh, unitary group has some, uh, some large radius, but I can just take that radius to be some number of order one. And um, now the thing is that the dimensionality is extremely high. And so the volume of a ball scales like the radius of the ball to a power, which is the dimension times some geometrical constant, which I'm not even gonna care about because it's going to drop out. I consider some um, ball, which has some constant radius, call it C, and it is a volume, which is some numerical constant uh, times C raised to a power, which is the dimension. The dimension of the unitary group in a space which is capital N dimensional is capital N squared. So the volume of the big ball goes like some constant to the power N squared. The volume of each one of the little balls, which just has radius delta, goes like that same geometrical constant times little delta to the power capital N squared, because that's the dimension of the space. And so the total volume of the unitary group or something that might be smaller than the full unitary group, but is completely contained within it, divided by the volume of each one of the balls is gonna go like the ratio of the order one radius C to the small radius delta raised to a power, the dimensionality of the group n squared. For us, capital N means two to the little n because we're considering n qubits. So that's some number which is uh, bigger than one if delta is small, raised to an enormous power, raised to the power two to the two to the n, okay? So the number of balls that we need to cover the whole space increases with the number of qubits doubly exponentially in n. Okay, we saw the same kind of thing when we were counting the um, Boolean functions on uh, n bits. Now, I'd like to compare that to the number of circuits that I can construct with some specified size, some specified number of gates. And I won't try to estimate that very precisely because for this argument, I really don't need to. But the circuit consists of a sequence of gates. Each one of those gates is chosen from some um, finite alphabet of possible gates. And then each one of the gates in that alphabet acts on some constant number of qubits. So if I take into account each time I add another gate to the circuit, which gate it is in my finite set, 
and which set of qubits it acts on, that's just going to be some factor which goes each time I add another gate, like some polynomial in N, okay? Like maybe if I'm considering two qubit gates, it goes like n squared, the number of ways you know I can choose a pair of qubits that the act that the uh, gate acts on. And I do that all together, capital T times in constructing the circuit. So it's some um, polynomial in n raised to the power t. That's the number of different circuits there are. Okay. And if I wanted to have a circuit for every ball, so that T is large enough, and you know I've chosen my circuits uh, cleverly enough, so that um, I have for every ball a uh, circuit contained in that ball. Then I uh, need for this number of circuits to be larger than the number of balls. To make the comparison, let's take logarithms. So if I take the logarithm of the number of circuits, um, that's going to go, that times a t goes like a poly n. So I want t to be larger than the number of balls divided by poly n, sorry, the log of the number of balls. And if I take the log of this doubly exponentially small number, I get the factor two to the two n in front and then times the log of c over delta. So in or order to cover all the balls, the number of circuits has to be doubly exponentially large. And for that, I'm going to need a circuit size, which is exponential in the number of qubits. Aside from this log poly n factor, it increases with the number of qubits like two to the two n, okay? If I were stuck to just the circuits of polynomial size, I'd be only able to reach only a very tiny fraction of all the balls. Most of the unitary group would be completely unexplored if I only considered some polynomial uh, uh, size to the circuits, okay? There are lots of circuits of polynomial size, but not nearly enough to reach all the nooks and crannies of Hilbert space. Hilbert space is just too darn big. Actually, the same remark applies if I consider not circuits in some ideal computational model, but if I consider physics, um, I could say the same sort of thing about if I start out with some simple initial state, um, like a product state, and then I'm going to let it evolve according to some Hamiltonian for some amount of time. And if that Hamiltonian is what I'll call a physically reasonable Hamiltonian, we'll talk more about what I, what I mean by that a little later, but I've sort of explained the idea before. Physics is local. So a Hamiltonian, which is physically reasonable, reasonable should be a sum of terms where all the terms act on some constant number of qubits. And um, by an argument similar to this one, um, it turns out that in order to reach all the possible states or realize all the possible unitaries, uh, we need to let the system evolve for a time which is exponential in the system size, exponential in the number of qubits. Nobody wants to wait that long. And if you only wait an amount of time which is polynomial in the number of qubits, then you'll be doomed to explore just a tiny fraction of all the possible states in Hilbert space. Now you notice I made kind of a, a subtle shift there from talking about unitaries to talking about states. Actually, there's an interesting difference um, between classical and quantum complexity here. If I consider n bits, um, I could consider like a reversible circuit that takes n bits to n bits. We talked about that. But the final bit string is always going to be something very simple. It's only n bits long, so it's something that's easy to write down. It doesn't really make much sense to talk about the complexity of a bit string, or in other words, the complexity is just linear in n, however long it takes you to print out a bunch of zeros and ones. Um, but quantum states are different than that. Uh, they don't have succinct classical descriptions, as we've discussed. And so for a typical quantum state in the Hilbert space of n qubits, it takes a quantum circuit, if I start out with the product state, 
state of exponential size to reach that state. Most um, quantum states in Hilbert space are so complex that we'll never be able to reach them uh, no matter how powerful our quantum engineers are in the future. Hilbert space is just too big. Now let's uh, think for a minute about what we would do if we wanted to simulate a quantum circuit using a classical computation model, like the classical circuit model. Well, I remarked on that, by, on that already, I think. I said, well, you can think of the gates as being unitary transformations acting on this state vector, which lives in a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. So in the end, a unitary is going to be a two to the n by two to the n matrix. And you can calculate what it is if you have enough memory by just multiplying together a lot of matrices. If you have some circuit, uh, each circuit is, um, each gate in the circuit is a unitary transformation. The result of applying T gates is the product of T unitary transformations. You can just multiply them out. And that is indeed a valid way of doing the simulation of the quantum circuit by a classical one. You notice it takes a lot of memory because I need to store a description of a vector in a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. So I would need an exponential in n amount of memory to do that. You can ask the question, what if we just don't have that much memory? Are we sunk? Is it impossible in that case to do a simulation of the quantum circuit with the classical circuit? Or can we somehow get by with an amount of memory which increases just polynomially with the number of qubits rather than exponentially? Well, the answer is that yes, you can. You can simulate a quantum circuit even if you only have a polynomial amount of memory. So the way to say that in complexity theory language is that the class BQP of problems that you can solve efficiently in um, the quantum circuit model is contained in the class P space, a very big computational class, of problems that can be solved if you have a, a polynomial amount of memory. Um, okay, well, let's see how that works. What we want our simulation to do on the classical computer is to, actually, this is more than it really has to do, but it's enough. Let's say we would like it to compute the probability of getting, um, a particular computational basis state as an outcome if we measured all the qubits after we apply a unitary circuit to the initial state of all zeros. Now, we might only be interested in um, the um, one particular answer bit, but that's okay each time we, uh, well, in principle, we could, we could figure out all the probabilities for the exponentially large uh, number of um, uh, possible outputs, and then we can sum them up. And to sum them all up, to accumulate them all, uh, that is, I'm summing over all the qubits that aren't uh, being measured, because I'm only interested in the marginal distribution for the answer bit. Uh, summing all those up doesn't require a big amount of memory, because I don't have to store all the sum ends, each time I add another term to the sum, I only have to keep the running total in order to go on to the next step and add another term to the sum. So I can certainly do that with a modest amount of memory. Um, but for some fixed x, I want to be able to compute this quantity, OK? And this unitary is a circuit consisting of capital T gates. And it's implicit, if I'm talking about BQP, that capital T is polynomial in N. This is a polynomial size quantum circuit that we're trying to simulate. And now we use a, a neat trick. We have uh, U here expressed as product um, going right to left of U1 times U2, blah, 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 UT minus one UT, just a product of unitaries. And then in between each pair of unitaries, I'm going to insert a sum over all the computational basis states. So I insert the projection onto x1, 
But then I sum x1 over all two to the n values here. And so I've indicated that as I'm summing over all the x sub t's where uh, x sub t is going to run from, x sub little t is gonna run from x sub one to capital, to x sub capital t minus one. So here I'm summing x one over all possible bit string values. And then between u2 and u3, I insert a projection onto x2 and I sum that over all possible values and so on, okay? And so now I've expressed this matrix element that I'm gonna to want to square to find the probability as, if you like, a sum over many computational paths in which the bit string which starts at zero gets a map to x1 and then to x2 and then to x3 and so on, finally to xt minus one and then in the end to x. And, um, but I have to sum over all the paths and there are an exponentially large number of them. In fact, in principle, I have two to the n possibilities for x of little t at each step. And I have all together, um, well, t minus one uh, intermediate values. And so I've got to sum up an exponentially large number of these products for each computational path for each fixed x1, x2, blah, blah, up to xt minus one. I have to take the product of these matrix elements of unitaries. And, um, and then I have to sum over uh, all of those terms. Like I said, I can accumulate the sum without having a huge amount of memory, but we wanna be sure that um, for calculating each one of the terms in the sum, we don't need a large amount of memory. So what I've described is something that physicists will recognize as the Feynman path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. I've just described unitary evolution by introducing some intermediate times and summing over all possible states at those intermediate times. And here is my very crude artist uh, conception of a sum over histories. I'm considering the initial uh, bit value zero of uh, progressing after capital T steps to the final value X uh, over lots of different possible intermediate choices. And each one of these little trajectories is supposed to represent a particular way of choosing the intermediate values of the X of T's. And for each one of those, there's some complex number, which I obtained by this product and I have to sum all those up, okay? So the number of complex numbers I have to sum up is pretty big. It's two to the N, because that's what, um, that's the number of possible choices for these intermediate X of T's um, at each time, but they're T minus one times. So altogether two to the N times T minus one. Um, and um, yeah, so there's, so I have to consider that for each computational path. I have to, once I've uh, fixed all of those X of T's, multiply these numbers together, capital T numbers, complex numbers that I have to multiply together. Actually, most of those numbers are zero. That makes life a little simpler. Uh, there's some classical circuit that I wanna do the job of computing each one of the factors in this product, which is just the matrix element between some computational state on the right here called Y and a computational state on the left here called Z of uh, one of our unitary gates. But the unitary gates only act on um, some small constant number of qubits, let's say two. And so this matrix element is going to vanish unless all of the uh, bits in the string uh, defining Y and Z are the same except for the ones corresponding to the qubits on which this gate acts non-trivially. So most of these guys are zero and the ones that aren't zero, I can store in a classical memory um, and I can make a call to that classical memory whenever I need one of these matrix elements. So I have to have the matrix elements stored of all of the gates in my universal set of unitaries uh, between bit strings on the right and on the left, but that's not really 
uh, so many matrix elements because it's real. I can really just think of this as a two qubit unitary because um, all the other qubits have to be fixed um, or it's going to vanish. Okay. And um, so we need to estimate each one of these matrix elements or the classical circuit that I call the classical memory um, is going to have an accuracy for each one of those, for, which is something like scales like one over capital T times two to the minus little n T minus one, because I'm gonna take a product of T of these, and then I'm gonna sum up all together two to the n T minus one terms. And I wanna be able to do that with some constant accuracy as explained earlier, some constant accuracy is good enough, okay? But it's not really such a hard task, at least in terms of memory usage. I got lots and lots of summing to do. I have to have enough precision in my computation of the matrix elements so that the errors are sufficiently small. But that just means I need a number of bits of precision, which is the log of this number plus some sufficiently large constant. And so that means a number of bits of precision, which really good, just goes like NT maybe times a log factor. And that's not so much memory. So if we can do the whole simulation by summing up lots and lots and lots of terms. We have to compute like crazy and we're kind of trading off some uh, memory for computation time using less memory, but computing longer because we have to sum up so many terms, but we never have to store lots of bits in order to get the answer. So that's what I mean by saying that you can simulate the quantum circuit in polynomial space, BQP is contained in P space. Okay, so now let's talk more about universal gates. In our computational model, we assume that there's a finite instruction set. Of, so that's formalized in the model by saying that our gates in the circuit are chosen from some finite alphabet. And you might say, if you're an experimental physicist, there's no good reason for that because uh, you, know, you can perform any single qubit unitary, for example, rotate the block sphere any way you want, acting on an atom by fooling around with your laser. And I guess that's true. I mentioned, um, I think it was last time, that when we get to the story of fault tolerant quantum computation, it really is important that we consider a finite instruction set because although the physical unitaries that you can do in the lab or in hardware are an uncountable set, the ones that you can do fault tolerantly that act on encoded information in a way that doesn't spread errors badly or doesn't compromise the error correcting power of the code really is just a discrete set. So it's a good thing that we're able to deal with a formal model of computation in which the quantum gates that we choose from is just some constant number. So what does it mean for the gate set to be universal? It means that we can do anything we want with these gates. Uh, if we put aside the complexity, uh, what does it mean to do anything we want? Well, we could certainly perform any possible computation um, that could be performed with uh, you know, an ideal gate of arbitrary unitaries. If I can approximate any unitary transformation acting on the n qubits by building a circuit from these gates. So that's what we're gonna mean by universality, that we can come as close as we want to any unitary acting on n qubits by building a circuit. And I was just reminding you here that in our model, each one of these gates acts on some constant number of qubits, like maybe two. Um, and uh, well, in the model, we allow the um, gate to act on any pair of qubits in the device, irrespective of how they're located in space. In other words, in the formal model, we don't worry about the geometry of how the qubits are laid out in space. It wouldn't be that big a deal if we did. Uh, if in fact the qubits were arranged in a one-dimensional line and I wanted to do, and I can only do nearest neighbor gates and one of the qubits is at the 17th place and the other qubit is at the 53rd place, um, 
I wouldn't be able to get them to interact directly, but I would be able to swap neighboring qubits or very closely approximate a swap if I have a universal gate set. So even if I could only do gates on nearest neighbors, I'd be able to swap, 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 swap until qubit 17 is sitting uh, right next to qubit 18. Um, and then I can do my two qubit gate on those two, and then I can swap, 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 and put uh, the moving qubit back to place 54 or whatever it was I said before, okay? So um, we might as well just assume that uh, there is no geometric locality constraint for the purpose of discussing complexity in the model, because doing all those swaps isn't so expensive. It certainly doesn't turn a polynomial size circuit into a super polynomial size one. Sometimes we settle for something less than universality called encoded universality, maybe because of symmetries or some such reason. Uh, we can't really come arbitrarily close to all the unitaries acting on n qubits, but some a subgroup of the unitaries. But as long as that's an exponentially large subgroup, then that's good enough for uh, accessing the power of quantum computation. Now I'm going to make a distinction between a couple of different kinds of universality. First of all, I speak of exact universality. And what I mean by that is I'm changing the rules a little now. I'm not considering a finite construction set, but I consider some class of quantum gates in a perhaps uncountable set. And exact universality means that by building circuits from those gates, I can hit on the nose exactly any unitary I want. So in a statement of exact universality, for example, is that two, uh, that should be two qubit gates, not two gates, uh, two qubit gates are exactly universal, okay? Uh, in other words, if I have any unitary that I want to reach acting on n qubits, then by putting together a suitable circuit of gates where each gate just acts on a pair of qubits, I can realize that unitary exactly. Um, in fact, if I can do any single qubit gate, that's exactly universal. If I have one fixed entangling two qubit gate. It has to be entangling. It can't take product states to product states. Um, but as long as it's entangling, and if I can let that uh, gate act on any pair of qubits, then together with single qubit gates, that's exactly universal. We can use that to build up any unitary we want. So it doesn't take much in the form of interaction between qubits in order to rule the world and get to the whole unitary group, it only takes two qubit interactions. And in fact, nothing special about those two qubit interactions, uh, anything will do as long as it creates entanglement. Another notion is generic entanglement, which, um, well, I was sort of touching on a minute ago, uh, but now I want to uh, say it in the context of a finite instruction set um, in fact, a single two qubit gate, in almost all cases, that means except for a set of measure zero, the non-entangling gates in particular, for two qubit gates, um, just using that gate and nothing else, as long as it can act on any pair of qubits, that's enough for universality. So universality is a very general thing. It's hard to avoid it. Um, if you don't have any interactions and you're stuck with single qubit gates, well, that's obviously not unitary because it's um, only going to take product states to product states. But once you can entangle, you can build up any unitary. Now, in the problems, you're going to be looking at particular universal gate sets to see that they're universal or try to understand why it's true that there are finite gate sets which are universal. But if you believe, and I'm going to show you in the rest of the lecture, that the statement of exact universality is true, uh, then if you can come as close as you want to any two qubit unitary, uh, that's going to be enough to um, build up any unitary. Once we know that the two qubit unitaries are exactly universal, then if we can approximate any two qubit unitary, then, um, then we're golden. And here are some examples of gate sets that are universal. Um, 
I'm using a notation, which I can't recall whether I used it before, this uh, lambda notation. When I write lambda of u, it means another, in saying it in words, I might say controlled u. Um, it means that u is applied to the second qubit if the first qubit is one and the identity is applied if the first qubit is zero. So remember we talked about the controlled not gate as an example of that. That's the lambda of x gate. It applies x to the second qubit if the first qubit is one and the identity otherwise. And um, I can also consider gates with more controls like lambda squared u or controlled controlled u means now it's a three qubit gate and it applies u to the third qubit only if the first two qubits are in the state one, one. Okay, so it has two control bits. Examples of universal gate sets are these. First, uh, let me uh, tell you what I mean by H, S, and T. Uh, these are all single qubit unitaries. H is the Hadamard. It, um, interchanges the X and the Z basis for a qubit. It's uh, written as a two by two matrix. It's this one, 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 minus one. Um, the S gate is a rotation about the Z axis by the angle pi over two, written as a two by two matrix. It's this one, it's diagonal with eigenvalues, E to the plus or minus I pi over four. And T is just the square root of S. It's the rotation about the z-axis of the block sphere by an angle pi over four. As a two by two matrix, it's diagonal with eigenvalues e to the plus or minus i pi over eight. And I think in the homework, what I'm calling s here, I might've called p, or p was the same as s up to an overall phase. S seems to be the more standard notation now. So I'm using s here, and I think in the type lecture notes as well. So anyway, what are these universal gate sets? If you can do a controlled S, a two qubit gate, which applies S when the control is one and you can apply a Hadamard, that's enough for universality. Another example, if you can do a controlled not gate, uh, lambda X, controlled not, and you can also do the two, uh, well, the single qubit gates H and T, the Hadamard, which flips the X and Z basis, the T which rotates by pi over four about the Z axis, that's also universal. Or if you can do the H and um, the S, um, well, that's not enough for universality, but even acting on a single qubit by themselves. But if you throw in the Toffley gate, which here, remember the Toffley gate is the controlled controlled knot, or in the notation I'm using here, lambda squared x. If you have a Toffoli and you've got a Hadamard and an S, that's enough for universality as well. And you'll uh, see some of these things from doing the problems. But what I wanna talk about now is why I claim that two qubit gates are exactly universal. Let's see how that argument goes. It, the argument is in two steps. The first step is to show that any unitary transformation can be expressed as a product of what I'm going to call two by two unitaries. I'll explain what that means in a minute. And then the second step is to take these two by two unitaries and express them as circuits of two qubit unitaries. So the two steps together mean that any unitary can be expressed as a circuit of two qubit unitaries. What I mean by a two by two unitary acting on a capital N dimensional space is a unitary which only has a two non-zero off diagonal entries. So you can think about it this way. It's a direct sum of a unitary acting on two of our computational basis states um, in this n-dimensional vector space and a direct sum of that with the identity acting on the other n minus two basis states, okay? That's what I mean by two by two unitary. Um, it acts non-trivially only on two of the computational basis states. A two qubit unitary is something different. It's a direct product of a unitary acting on two qubits and the identity acting on the remaining n minus two qubits. Notice I'm using capital N here and little n here. If we consider the um, Hilbert space of little n qubits, 
that's two to the n dimensional. So for little n qubits, capital N here is two to the n. So what I'm calling a two by two unitary acting on little n qubits is one which uh, really acts on the span of two of the computational basis states and acts trivially on all the other computational basis states. Whereas a two qubit unitary um, is a direct product of a two qubit transformation uh, acting on a particular pair of qubits with product with the identity acting on the other little n minus two qubits. Okay, so let's see why this statement one is true that every unitary is a product of two by two unitaries. Well, let's, we have um, capital N basis states in this capital N dimensional space. I'm gonna label them zero, one, two, blah, 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 up to capital N minus one. So consider the unitary acting on the basis state labeled zero. It's some vector, which um, of course I can expand in terms of the basis. Now I claim that there's a unitary that I can construct, I'm calling it W sub zero, which is a product of N minus one, two by two unitaries with the property that U of acting on zero is the same thing as W sub zero acting on zero. Why do I say that? Well, let's consider a product of two by two unitaries which act in the following way. Acting on zero, it's going to take zero to a, um, if it acts non-trivially on zero, to a linear combination of two of the basis states. So I'm gonna call the other basis state in, uh, in, in its image one. So there's a unitary which maps, um, which is two by two, which maps zero to A0, zero, zero plus B01 zero, for some B0. A0 is the coefficient of zero here in this um, result of applying U to computational basis state zero. So that's what the first two by two unitary does. Then another two by two unitary comes along and it's going to take B sub zero one to A sub one one plus B sub one two. Okay, this is the same A sub one as appears in this linear combination um, for the result of U applied to zero. And there's gonna be some unitary that does that because of course I'm guaranteed that since u is unitary, um, this guy has uh, norm one. And so b01 is going to have a norm, um, well, less than one, but the result of applying u to zero is going to have a coefficient of one, which is um, can't be any larger than, um, than one. So for b0, one, it can't be any larger than B0. And we know that um, A0 squared plus B0 squared is equal to one. I, I'm talking too much. I think it should be clear to you that uh, there's some unitary which pay, takes this B0 one to A1. Uh, that's the coefficient of one in, in this uh, linear combination here, plus some uh, other complex number B1 times a state I'll call two. And then there's another two by two unitary and it takes B12 to A22 plus B sub two, three and so on. And I keep go, uh, going that way, applying one two by two unitary after another until I have completely constructed this uh, expansion of the state resulting from U applying to zero. So that means I have achieved with that product of U, uh, two by two unitaries what I claim. This product has the property that when acting on zero, it gives the same thing as when u acts on zero. The total number of two by two unitaries I needed was, well, just the number of steps here. If you count them up, uh, you can see there were n minus one steps to completely construct this linear combination as an image of a product of two by two unitaries. Okay, so what do we do next? 
So now let's consider the unitary, which is the result of applying the inverse of w0 to u. OK, well, that's going to have the property, let's call it u1, that acting on 0, it gives 0. So in effect, u1 has become a, we had an n by n unitary u, but u1 is really an n minus 1 by n minus 1 unitary. It really acts on the orthogonal complement of the state zero. And now I can do that same construction as before. And I can find a W1, which now is going to be a product of n minus two, two by two unitaries, such that W1 acting on the uh, basis state one gives the same result as U1 acting on the basis state one. And U1, and W1, well, U1 has the property that um, it, um, acting on zero, it gives zero. And I could choose W1 to have that property too, because all of the two by two unitaries are chosen to act trivially on zero, okay? And so now I can define a U sub two, which is the result of applying first U1 and then W1 inverse, or, we're calling what u1 is, that's u, uh, and then moving from right to left, w sub zero inverse, w sub one inverse, u2 is now an n minus two by n minus two unitary. That is, it's going to preserve the basis state one and preserve the basis state zero. And then I can take that n minus two by n minus two uh, unitary and chop its dimension down again um, and I do that with a, a product of n minus three, two by two unitaries. Okay, so what we, when we're all done, uh, we have obtained a uh, unitary which acts on, uh, acts exactly the way u does. In other words, uh, in each step, the, we obtain the identity acting on all the basis states we've taken care of so far, plus some non-trivial unitary acting on its orthogonal complement. And after all together, n minus one steps, uh, we have only the identity left. And that means that uh, this product is going to be the identity, or in other words, we've expressed u as just taking, a, oh, uh, I guess some of these were supposed to be inverses. I'm sorry, uh, this should be inverse and this should be inverse. And that means uh, multiplying by first Wn minus two on the left then Wn minus three and so on. We have U equals W zero, W one, Wn minus three, Wn uh, blah, 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 up to Wn minus two. So each one of these guys is a product of two by two unitaries and U has been expressed as a product of the Ws. And if you count up, if you're interested, how many two by two unitaries we needed, in the first step, we needed n minus one, in the next step, n minus two, and so on. Altogether, it adds up to one half n times n minus one, two by two unitaries. That's enough to um, construct any unitary acting on the capital N dimensional um, vector space. So that was step one of the argument. Remember step two is to show that every two by two unitary can be constructed as a circuit of two qubit unitaries. How's that gonna work? Well, to see that this circuit identity is going to be very handy. Uh, my notation, which I think I explained before, is that this is my notation for a control and control gate. It means that only if X and Y are both equal to one is a non-trivial unitary applied to the third qubit, and which here I'm calling U squared. And here I've written that as a circuit, which is supposed to be read from a left to right, that is the gate furthest to the left is the one that acts first. And this means a controlled U this means a controlled knot. I could have called this an X, but this is kind of a standard notation for a controlled knot or controlled X. This is the controlled U adjoint or controlled inverse of U 
controlled knot, and this is the controlled U controlled by the first qubit. Here, the controlled U and controlled U inverse are controlled by the second qubit. And I claim uh, that this is an equality. This circuit of five gates gives this transformation. So let's verify that. Uh, well, what we have to do is count the number of times that U is applied to the third qubit given that X and Y are computational basis states. Um, well, okay, let's look at the circuit. Here we have a controlled Y. So that means when Y is equal to one, uh, U is applied to the third qubit. So I wrote Y here, which is one if one is, if Y is one and zero if Y is zero. And then uh, we have this controlled knot here, and that puts into the second bit register the value of the XOR of X and Y. In other words, Y gets flipped as if X is one and not if X is zero. And then the inverse of U is applied controlled by X, um, XOR Y. So I wrote minus X XOR Y as the number of times U is applied. In other words, I had a U and then uh, this number of U inverses. So the net number of U's is Y minus X, X or Y so far, but we're not done. The, um, this control knot uh, undoes what the first control knot did and that's good so that um, the X and Y will be preserved as uh, was implied by writing this controlled controlled U squared. And then I have one more gate, which is controlled by the first bit. And that means the number of views applied is going to be x. It's going to be 1 if x is 1 and 0 if x is 0. Now, it's handy to write the XOR. That XOR is the same thing as addition modulo 2 of uh, the bits x and y as x plus y minus 2xy. So in other words, if x and y are both 1, this is 0. It becomes 1 plus 1 minus 2. If x and y are both zero, it's zero. If x is one and y is zero, or y is one and x is zero, then it's one. It's the same thing as an XOR. So now it's easy to see how things add up. Because I have a y minus a y, an x minus an x, and the number of times u is applied is 2xy. So that means u squared is applied if xy is equal to one. And that's true only if x and y are equal to one. So that's why the circuit identity is true. And once we see how it works, it's easy to generalize it. So here we used the uh, controlled knot and the controlled U and the controlled U inverse. And we saw that we could build this controlled controlled U squared. In a similar way, if I have a controlled m minus one times u and uh, lambda m minus one x and a controlled u and a controlled u inverse, that's enough for me to make the u squared controlled by m bits. And it's essentially the same circuit. The controlled not gates I want to replace by uh, controlled m minus one times uh, x gates. And for this last control U, I want to replace that by the U controlled by M minus one bits. And then the calculation is going to be almost the same as before. Um, the first control U is going to apply U to the last bit uh, XMM times, once if XMM is one, zero if XMM is zero. And then the last uh, controlled U, because it's controlled by M minus one bits, is the number of times it's applied is just the product of the first M minus one bits. X1, X2, product, blah, 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 X M minus one. Only if they're all one, in other words, is the U applied. And then um, I have this U inverse here. So I'm gonna subtract some U's away. The number of times the U inverse is applied is determined by the XOR of 
this uh, last bit uh, or last control bit XM and the product of the first M minus one bits. Because remember I replaced the controlled X by this X controlled by M minus one bit. So it applies X only if all of X one through X minus one are equal to one. So the number of times U inverse is applied is the XOR of XM and the product of X one through X minus one. And now I use the same uh, identity as before to write the XOR as the sum of XM plus the product of the XJs minus twice the product of these two things, which now is gonna be the product X1, X2, blah, blah, up to XM. So the same thing happens as before, more or less. The XM gets canceled. The product of X1 through XM minus one gets canceled. And what's left is twice the product of X1 through XM. So that means u squared is applied if x1 is equal to one, x2 is equal to one, blah, 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 up to xm is equal to one. That's the construction of the controlled m times u squared from these other gates, okay? So now you see, I can use this procedure recursively. Every unitary has a square root. So suppose I can do any controlled unitary uh, you like. A controlled unitary is a two qubit gate. So I'm imagining I can do any two qubit gate I want, then I can certainly do a controlled unitary acting on a pair of qubits. So from this circuit identity, what it's telling me is I can just take u to be the square root of v, and then I can construct a controlled controlled v from a circuit, and all of the gates in this circuit are two qubit gates, okay? But I can, I can construct any controlled controlled V that way, okay? In particular, I can make a Toffley that way. A Toffley is just a controlled controlled X. But then I can use this generalized step to get to unitaries that are controlled by three bits, okay? Because once I have the controlled controlled V, I can use the controlled controlled V and these other gates I know how to construct to get the controlled 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 V, okay? And so building up step by step, I can uh, get any unitary controlled by M bits for any M up to N minus one if I have all together N qubits, okay? Remember that if we can do Toffley's, Toffley's are universal for reversible classical computation. And uh, that means we might need uh, a few n syllabits for this, but that means that we can realize any permutation of the computational basis states with a circuit of Toffley's. Okay, because that's what reversible classical computation is. It's a permutation of the computational basis states. Okay. Um, so starting just with these two qubit gates, I can do any permutation because I only need Toffelis for that of the computational basis states. And I can do a controlled M of V for any unitary V and for any M. Um, from uh, one up to n minus one, if they're all together n qubits. Okay, so we're almost done. In particular, that means we know how to build from two qubit gates, the unitary V applied to the target qubit controlled by n minus one qubits. Now, in a system with n qubits, that is what I'm calling a uh, two by two unitary, okay? It acts non-trivially only on the span of two bit strings. It doesn't do anything unless the first n minus one bits are all equal to one. So it's non-trivial action is on the span of n minus one ones zero and n ones. And it's just the identity acting on the orthogonal complement. That's a two by two unitary, okay? 
It just acts on the span of two vectors in our basis set. It's the identity acting on the rest. Now I'd like to be able to do a arbitrary two by two unitary using my universal gate set, the two qubit unitaries. Well, I've explained how we do this, how we do the control n minus one times V using that gate set of two qubit unitaries. I've explained how we do the Toffoli. From the Toffoli, we can do any permutation of the computational basis states. I'd like to do a two by two unitary on an arbitrary pair of basis states, X and Y for both strings of n bits, labeled by strings of n bits. So consider some permutation sigma, which takes x to the string all ones except the last bit is zero, and takes y to the string all ones. And consider constructing sigma, I can make that out of Toffley gates, controlled n minus one uh, v, which we've seen we how to construct out of two qubit gates, and then the inverse of sigma. Okay, well, that is just the two by two unitary that acts on the bit strings X and Y. Because X and Y get mapped to uh, these two guys, the control V acts on uh, those uh, two strings, and then inverting sigma sends uh, the basis back to what it was to start with. The effect of that is just the unitary V acting on the span of X and Y. So that completes the argument. We've seen that two qubit gates allow us to get any two by two unitary. And we saw that any two by that uh, any unitary transformation can be reached from a product of two by two unitaries. That shows that the two qubit gates are an exactly universal set. So far, we haven't talked about the case of finite uh, universal gate sets. And I'll say something about that in the next lecture. So until then, take care of yourself, uh, be well, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>